all zooming back in here. Um, just remember, if you guys have um, something exciting that came out of your breakout room, uh, anything you want to share um, or get posted, be sure to send it to Robert um, via chat or email afterwards. Uh, last time we got some several interesting uh, comments in input from there. So I really appreciate that. We got some really good stuff in our chat room, Vicki, and I'll, I'll probably try to talk with you after the meeting or something like that and some thoughts, but we had, we had a, a lot of years of exec membership in there with a lot of great brains. And so you know, we've got some good stuff I thought that would be helpful and I figured I'd just run it by you later on. That'll be awesome, Charles. I got a meeting right after this meeting, yeah, but sometime, whatever, I'll just... then I'm free on my way home like we usually chit chat. <laughs> Call me whenever you can. All right, great. Thank you so much. All right, so without any further ado, um, <clears throat> to introduce our concentrator, uh, um, John Peak. And most of you know he's quite a character and John has held many jobs in his very career. He started all when he was age seven on a Saturday morning when allowance and chores were not a, large enough to grow to fund his interest in little airplanes. So he says, mom, what can I do for earning money? She says, you can sweep the driveway for 25 cents. You can weed the garden for 25 cents. You can polish your pop shoes, three pairs for 50 cents, wash windows, 15 cents. And before you knew it, John was on his way to a hobby shop. So here he is to fill you in on the rest of the story. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. I'm going to be sharing a screen here in a little bit. Um, but for right now, I'll just talk to you. I wanted to fill you in on my, my many and varied career choices uh, from my youth up until now. I, uh, after I got really interested in model airplanes and, and uh, you know, I was making, I think, 25 cents an allowance. So I became the chore guy and, uh, at home. And I'd, every Saturday, I was like, what can I do? What can I do? because I'd want to buy a model airplane to build up at, uh, we were living in Los Angeles at the time in Hancock Park over from Larchmont. And there was a little hobby shop there called Stacy's Hobbies. And oh, all week long, I drool over uh, different model airplanes that I wanted to buy and build. So around that time, I, at age eight, I was fully into the Cub Scouts and uh, we get this thing called Boys Life Magazine. And in the back, there are always these opportunities to earn some money. So in this case, it was greeting cards. So I, I ordered two cases of greeting cards and I went at age eight in my neighborhood, knocking door to door, selling greeting cards. And uh, it was, I didn't realize there was anything unique about it, but people, you know, look at me now, age eight, you were knocking door to door. And I go, yep, I did it. And the whole goal that time was to earn a watch. I wanted a watch so badly. So I, I sold the two cases and I got a watch. And within a week, I wore it into the shower and it got full of water. <laughs> but it was a great experience learning to go door to door uh, with a big smile on my face because I'm going to get a watch. And um, anyway, that was fun. So at age nine... Uh, I was a, I was mowing the family lawn, and uh, by this time we had moved down to La Jolla, and I struck out into the neighborhood with our lawn mower, and uh, we, there was a, a hill called Sugarman down the hill from La Jolla Scenic, and I'd I'd go down the hill riding in my uh, my wagon with the lawnmower in the front. It had one of those traction wheels in the back and I'd go down the hill and then I could ride it back up. But I had a few customers down at the bottom of the hill there that I cut the lawn for. And uh, but then my next big job was uh, from age 13 to about 15, I finally got the big money job that every kid wants. I got the Union Tribune paper route that I got to do for two years. And boy, talk about a training for owning your own business. You've got to deliver that paper every day, on time, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And this is while going to school, being involved in Boy Scouts now. Luckily, I, I come from a family of seven kids. So uh, we, one of my brothers or sisters would arrange to, to deliver while I was off on a camping trip. But uh, 
I figured I made, uh, oh, and the other thing, those of you who owned a, uh, uh, or had a paper route as a kid, not only to deliver the paper, but then once a month you had to go door to door and collect the money for the paper. So uh, that was interesting. And I earned the money for a Suzuki 125 uh, duster. It, it, it looked like a motocross bike, but I could ride it on the street. And that was a big deal. My horizons just blossomed from there. And my big goal then was to get a job at La Jolla Shores Market because then I could go to work and I could go surfing. And uh, there weren't any openings at La Jolla Shores Market. My dad said, John, just go down there every week with a big smile on your face and say, is there an opening yet? Is, is my job available yet? And on my third week down there, bam, I got the job. And I worked there for two years. Uh, and I was a bag boy. And I think I made a buck 75 an hour. And back then, that was big money. So that was exciting. Well, I, I graduated from Hoya High School at age 17 and got a job through a buddy of mine's dad owned a bunch of restaurants called Bull Weevil. And so he got me a job flipping burgers and cleaning the restaurant at night, which I hated. I, I mean, I, I pretty much loved every job I've ever done, but that job was just not for me. And three weeks into it, I get a call from my brother who says there was an opening at La Jolla Beach and Tennis Club as a lifeguard. <laughs> Amen, hallelujah. What a great job. I did that for two summers, my, uh, the year I graduated and uh, the year after my first year in college, and it was wonderful. I, what I loved about it the most was the early mornings when we, as the, we were lifeguards, but we were really beach boys, I would rake the beach by hand with these large rakes, and I would get it looking like corduroy, and it was just beautiful. And then about 10 in the morning, people would start walking out on the beach and screwing it all up, but I, I, that's when I realized I was into the aesthetics. I was into the aesthetics of being at the beach, beautifying the beach, getting it all clean and nice. Uh, so that was a, a great job. When I went off to college, uh, I started at UCSD and then transferred up to Berkeley. And while I was at Berkeley, I got this great job at the stadium. Uh, we would we would cut the grass at the football stadium. We would mark the field every week for the football games. And then after the football games, we would clean the stadium. So I was able to put in about 28 hours a week doing that. And it really kept my sanity because uh, – that much, uh, uh, you know, classes and reading and all that other stuff. I, I'm a physical person. I needed to move and use my body doing something. So that those, those uh, having that job at the stadium was absolutely fantastic. Well, I would come home during the summer. And the first summer I came home from Berkeley, I, I put out some flyers to local uh, real estate people. And we started, uh, my buddy Pete and I started Rock and Roll Painting Company. We didn't call that to our clients, but that's what we called it to each other. And we painted two houses that summer, and I, I did as well financially or better than, than working full-time at uh, the Beach and Tennis Club. But there weren't as many girls around either, so that was the – got more money but, but less, uh, less interaction with the ladies. Um, then – uh, then another summer, I came home and I got a job at UCSD. I decided I didn't want to have my own business at that point because I needed to take two classes to get caught up at school. So I, I became a janitor at UCSD. We were blowing and vacuuming and washing windows. Again, I loved that job. It was, uh, I just like taking things that are messy and making them beautiful. Well, I uh, graduated from UCSD, uh, and then, uh, I went off to be a ski bum at uh, Snowbird for one season, and I loved it. That Snowbird is known for being steep and deep, and uh, I was a janitor there, replaced toilet paper in the bathroom, swept the walkways, dug snow uh, steps. Uh, it was, I, I really enjoyed that job. I could get in almost 40 hours of work in three days, and then I'd ski straight for four days. Great job. Well, my first real job was selling uh, solar hot water and space heating systems for Archer Industries up in uh, Escondido. And uh, 
that was that was a lot of uh, meeting people, knocking door to door, and I did well at that. But got an opportunity to work with a friend of mine who had a a, a company called Image Dynamics, and we did. Uh, I don't know if you remember the uh, this thing called multi-image. It's where we'd connect computers and soundtracks and voice to multiple slide projectors, and you'd get what looked like uh, um, almost a video. Well, I did that for a few years, but then uh, got the bug to become a minister, and so got accepted off to seminary. But in the meantime, my church said, please stay for a year and run the youth program. Uh, uh, so I did that. And during that period of that year, uh, at age 25, my brother and I started painting, uh, started Peak Brothers painting on the side to augment my income because uh, youth guys don't make very much money. So at the end of the year, though, I was to head off to, to, to back east to go to school again. And I realized, I don't think I want to be a minister. I really, really, really like painting. And uh, so that's how Peak Brothers got started. And this is our 40th year, 40th year in this business. And it's kind of a roundabout way that I, I got to doing what I'm doing. But um, I've enjoyed pretty much every one of my jobs except flipping burgers at, uh, at the Bull Weevil. So I'm going to share my screen here if I can get it here. There we go. All right. And I'm going to share a few. Uh, oh, here we go. I'm sorry. There we go. Okay, I'm going to show you some videos of some projects we've done recently. Can you hear the sound of the video okay? No, John, you have to stop your share and reshare and click the share computer sound button at the bottom in order for that to work. So you have to stop sharing. Okay. Completely. Okay. Okay. Let me go back. Stop sharing your screen completely. Uh, okay. I just share sound. Okay. Stop share. There it is. Okay. Now, now I'll go share. Share screen. And share computer sound at the bottom. Share, share. Right, I see it there. Optimize for video clip. Okay, share. There we go. Okay. There we go. So here the guys are. They've shut off the, the sanders for me because it's very loud. They're... Uh, sanding down these windows that have been brought down from upstairs uh, so that we can work on them very easily here on benches. So we're using vacuum sanders to buzz down and get to a, a sound surface. And then we'll be replacing the putty glazing. Nice job, guys. Thank you. Here's a stack of windows getting ready to go. With all the prep going on, you can see we're being super careful with dust. So everything's been covered up, uh, even though I think the guys are working on the outside today. Let's go on outside and see how it's looking. Guys are really moving along. Windows are nicely prepped, as you can see. The, uh, the paint that you see slopped over on the glass, uh, we do that because we have glass mask behind it. This will be razor cut when these windows are painted and uh, when we pull off the liquid masking, it'll be a super sharp, clean line. Someone upstairs working on the windows? There you go. Is that Ricky? Hi. Hey, Ricky. Hi, how are you? Good, good. You guys are really moving along. It looks good. Well, that's day two here at the Darlington House. We'll be back tomorrow to check it out again. Okay, now I need to get... It's hard for me to see the screen here. <laughs>
Hold on a second. Uh, oh, here we go. Let me stop this. And let's see. I want to go to, I want to show you the putty glazing. This is something a lot of people don't do, but we do putty glazing of windows. Say that again, Tom. So we prime it first. We prime it first before we put the glazing, so that way the glazing sticks better. And when you scrape it with the blade, it's more easy. I see. Stay there. Yeah. Yeah. So looking much, much better. Right. Yeah. Are there any over here that you've done? Finished? These over? ones are done. Ah, yeah. This one's right here. Wait, what an improvement. My God. Yeah. I showed some photos of these the other day. See, this is the, how they look. With no glazing? And there it is with no glazing. Okay. Yeah. Oh boy. Very rough. And oh, yeah. here's what they look like. Worked on them a little bit. Beautiful. Yeah. Pull screen and then. John, what is the Darlington House? The Darlington House is a, uh, it, it's owned by the Social Service League of La Jolla. And they use it for events to raise money for the League House, which is next door. That's for ladies with limited income to, uh, to live uh, with uh, low rent. Okay, we don't need to see this again. <laughs> Tony taking it all off. Okay, and then I have another video here, kind of fun to watch. Is uh, this is uh, this building is uh, I think the first residence that Irving Gill built for Wheeler Bailey, where he used the uh, the concrete um, wall system that he's well known for, like what he used to build St. James by the Sea, the La Jolla Recreation Center, um, uh, you know, a lot of the buildings you see around town with the, the arches uh, are done with poured in place concrete. Well, this was the first use of that system because Wheeler Bailey, uh, who, who uh, commissioned this house, uh, owned a, uh, I think the only concrete plant in town. So here's this. Hi everybody, it's a beautiful Friday afternoon here in La Jolla. Check out this view. There's La Jolla Point across the way, and we're at a home here, originally built in the early part of the 1900s by Wheeler Bailey on the cliffs of La Jolla. It's a Pueblo-style building. Uh, the, the interior is 100% redwood, no painted surfaces, except some of the windows in this house. We're working on the 
putty glazed windows, which are in uh, fairly poor shape after many years of service. Uh, you can see the guys over here on the, the windward face uh, working on the high windows. Let's see if you can get a shot there of how, what they're working on. There we go. See that? Isn't that gorgeous? So what we're doing is uh, scraping these windows down, sanding them, removing the failed glazing, and then uh, putting on an epoxy consolidant, which is a very thin watery epoxy that soaks into the soft wood that's uh, been damaged by so much uh, uh, sea moisture that, um, that it gets kind of furry. You can sand it until the cows come home and it just keeps furring. So what we use is an epoxy, <coughs> watery epoxy to consolidate the wood. And then we use a uh, filler, an epoxy filler here. This is not Bondo. Uh, it costs quite a bit more than Bondo. And uh, two coats of that over these surfaces and then sand them. We're filling the, uh, the failed glazing putty here uh, on the windows. And then these, the glass will get all cleaned up and we'll uh, then put some liquid masking on there to seal any slight seams that are between the putty and the glass. And then we'll prime and put two coats of paint on there. They're really gonna turn out beautifully. I'll show you some pictures uh, as we get a little further along. So here, the guys have uh, finished most of the filling. They put liquid masking on the glass, which protects the glass while we're doing our painting. It also seals the, uh, the slight gaps that can uh, come up between the putty glazing and the glass. Now, at this point, uh, it's getting a full coat of primer, and then we'll detail it. We'll look for any uh, open seams, any defacements, and those will all get filled and then sanded and spot primed and then we'll uh, we'll put two coats of, uh, of finish on top of it and at the end we'll use a razor knife to cut the uh, the liquid masking away and then peel the uh, liquid mask off the glass now i want to share with you guys uh a a project that we're we are on, as of today, we're still on this job. So there'll be some updates for this. But this is down uh, one street up from Winnensee. This is a really cool little bungalow that I want you to check out. Here's a super cool beach cottage down by Winnensee with its original shingle siding and wood putty glazed windows. The homeowner has decided to bring it back to historically accurate condition, which meant replacing all of the windows with windows that would match what would have been put in in the early teens of last century. In the process of doing this, we also found that we needed to replace quite a number of shingles. And so I created a new system for dipping the shingles so that they would not cup over the long haul. Dipping allows you to seal the back side as well as the front side of the shingle so uh, it will not cup and curl. Here's the paint professor again with your pro tip of the week. Let me show you a cool little setup I made. I needed to dip a bunch of uh, shingles, so I created a, a bin here with my oil and a rack with wires to hold. After I dip my shingles, I put them in the rack. You can see I've got this plastic patio overhang. I've tipped it at an angle so that when I put my shingles in, they drip down this way into my my little plastic gutter, which then drips into my catch bucket. Uh, it's turned out pretty well. I've, uh, this is my first time doing anything like this. So I, I thought about it a while and, and thought, well, this, this ought to work pretty well. So 
there it is. Uh, we'll let these dry overnight, stack them, and then uh, and then do another set. And that's your pro tip of the week from John Peake, the paint professor. Now the windows are going to get long-term protection by doing a pre-treatment before priming. We are using penetrating epoxy to soak into the, all this bare wood so that basically plasticizes it before priming and it's going to prevent rotting for years and years. So here is uh, San Diego Sash, the workspace. These are some of the windows that I worked on last week. These have been uh, epoxied, primed, and then they're going to be installed in the frame. Looking good, man. We're pre-treating the, uh, the sashes with an epoxy. And that way, we'll keep these uh, windows from rotting over the long haul. We're right down by the beach, and so it's important that everything be sealed super well. Not just with primer, but with, uh, with this clear penetrating epoxy and then primer. Here are some windows that we did last week, and then they had to trim them a bit for uh, fitting into the, uh, the frames. Okay, this one right here will go into this frame. So we hit it again with some epoxy, and we'll prime it again on that edge. Now we're doing all this before they put the glass in the sash itself. Uh, and that way, all these, uh, all these hidden surfaces that'll be behind the putty will be completely sealed up. So our goal is to give these folks windows that uh, when I'm dead in the ground, they're still gonna look sharp. I'd show you the tail end of that. I, I love the splash at the end. <laughs> um, so one final thing I wanted to show you, we, we did, I, I already showed you the Irving Gill house, uh, the, the Windows View Bungalow restoration. Um, let's see. Oh, the last thing, I don't know if I've shown you this before, but we also do a lot of cabinets. Now, right now we're doing a project where uh, the cabinets um, are a, kind of a light yellowish red and they wanted to upgrade them to have a more deep walnut tone and so we're capable of doing that of, of changing the stain color on the wood um, but we're also capable of, of um, taking stained cabinets and making them a solid a solid white is a real hit right now and that's a great way to lighten up your kitchen but let me show you this um, refinishing kitchen cabinets It was a fun project in La Jolla, refinishing some kitchen cabinets in a beautiful home. You can see the first priority when you start a project like this is protecting the surfaces that you will not be painting. So that takes a bit of effort and then we prepare the surfaces that are going to be painted by cleaning and deglossing them. We set up in this particular situation at the, uh, the back patio using an easy up and creating a clean room environment in which to spray. Here's the entrance to our little tent outside the, uh, the kitchen area. This is what we call a baker's rack. We use this to stack our panel doors, as you can see here, while they dry in between coats. Here's Roberto, hard at work putting a coat on the back side of one of the doors. He'll first spray the edges and then paint the back side of the door in two directions, ensuring a complete and even coverage for the first coat.
he's overlapping 50% on each pass to make sure they get, we get the proper mill build. That's a great job, Roberto. Now into the rack to dry. Now back inside, Roberto is painting the fixed portions of the kitchen in place. And then comes cleanup. Pull off all the tape and paper when everything's dry and look at that beautiful, beautiful kitchen. And there's the homeowner getting back to normal. Isn't that just gorgeous? What a pleasure to work at our craft in such a beautiful environment. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this video. We've sure enjoyed painting these kitchens and sharing it with you. So guys, that's my, uh, I th those are some videos I thought you might enjoy seeing. Um, and let's see here. I have about four minutes left if you want to leave. Oh, okay. Time. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to give you a little story on that last uh, cabinet job. Uh, we did that job five years ago. Well, they, the homeowner called me about a month ago because I said, you know, we give a five-year warranty. They called me up and, and had me over to the house, and there were some fa failures that uh, were not acceptable. Um, and so I, I told them, we're going to completely refinish your cabinets. So uh, two weeks ago, we went back and uh, took everything apart as if we'd never done it and did it again from scratch. It was a, a failure of the material that was specified uh, that, that we've since found it should never be used now. Uh, we, we have never used that product again. But uh, the homeowner was so pleased uh, he said, I didn't think you guys were going to back up your warranty. I honestly didn't think it was going to happen. So uh, the fact that we took care of it and uh, now they're going to have us back to paint the rest of the house. So I, it, it, I, I just want you to know that when you refer me out there, that's the type of, um, uh, that's the way I like to treat customers, whether you refer them to me or not. I don't, I don't care who they are. That's just the way I like to do things. It's the way my parents raised me. My mom and dad were just wonderful people. I still, you know, even today, they've been, my dad's been dead five years or so, and my mom over 10. And I had a Facebook contact today uh, from someone who, whose father worked with my dad. And he's, she just wanted to tell me what, how highly she thought of my parents. So it's a wonderful thing to come from great stock like that. So, hey, Jim. Uh huh. Yeah, 